Dominic Strasser, co-founder of OneSpin Solutions, was named VP Engineering in June 2012 and has a track record of 20 plus years in management and engineering. Since 2005, he headed the development of OneSpin's flagship product 360 DV. Prior to OneSpin, Strasser led a formal verification development group at Infineon Technologies in Munich. When at Siemens led industrial research projects on formal verification and industrial computing. He began his career in the compiler department of Siemens Nixdorf, doing C and C++ compilers for Unix and mainframe operating systems. Dominic holds a diploma in Formica, so apologies for the pronunciation, <laughs> which is equivalent to a master's degree in computer science from the Munich Technical University, Germany. That's lovely. Thank you, Dominic. Thank you, Sarah. Hello and uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to present you um, an application of machine learning. We have now learned a lot of uh, theory behind and uh, I want to show you how OneSpin has applied uh, machine learning algorithms on uh, our data that we have collected over uh, the decades that uh, OneSpin exists. So I'm going to start with a short company profile, then I'm going to uh, talk about what we, what the goals were, uh, what our challenges were, what we achieved, and a small summary in the end. So just about OneSpin. So OneSpin uh, has been founded in 2005. It's a uh, capital backed by Azini Capital. And you might now may notice that I am talking about 20 years of, uh, of data that we have collected. So we have older data. So uh, when Sarah read out my resume, basically the activities that uh, OneSpin is uh, based on have started in uh, way earlier. So um, the first check-in into our code base has been made in 1992. So um, we were in the central uh, research group of Siemens, then spun out of into Infineon. And then finally in 2005, we became a startup company. And we are still around. And we have uh, our offices uh, spread all over the world, from San Jose through, through Munich, uh, Tokyo, and uh, another office, and a bigger office in Novi Sad in Serbia in uh, Europe. Our R&D is mostly uh, based in Munich, Germany. So, and uh, we are profitable, and we have a very uh, nice growing uh, uh, res um, uh, money base coming in. Uh, booking is uh, increasing every year um, nicely. We have uh, quite a far customer base, around 50 customers, and we have some high rollers in there like Intel, Bosch, Hitachi, our uh, founder Infineon, Nokia, Renesas, and Xilinx. Um, we are, as we are around for many, many years, uh, we have a very mature formal technology, and uh, we have validated it on uh, the hundreds of projects. So, um, so let's now talk about uh, we, we our company focus is IC integrity. It's not just uh, functional co correctness uh, that we are face that we are uh, focusing on, because functional correctness is basically is the lab. This is the ideal conditions under under which you are under which you are testing your designs. But if you go out into the wild. Uh, you suddenly have other uh, challenges like uh, radiation and uh, suddenly you have random um, uh, effects affecting your IC that uh, may uh, infect uh, your or affect the functionality of your uh, design. So um, you need uh, tooling there like uh, automated uh, FMEDA analysis, computation of safety metrics and verification of safety mechanisms. And when you are not only in your in your device that you are implanted in, but you also have uh, uh, people using it, and uh, not everybody is uh, is nice uh, a nice user and maybe a hostile user too. You also the, the uh, correctness of your of your uh, of your functionality expands into uh, security problems and and uh, trusted um, functionality of your design. So. Um, if if your design is not safe, it is not secure. There's no no question whether it's safe or whether it's correct. If it's not secure, um, somebody will drive away with your car, and you can't even uh, 
use it anymore. So this is why why uh, one's been uh, has certified technology to ensure the integrity of your um, tool through their verification solutions. So now let's jump into uh, the actual topic. So what we want to achieve is that we want to leverage our data that has been granted to us by by uh, our users. So um, over the years, many of our users have granted us access and granted us the, the rights to use their designs in, in our regression test suites. And this we have um, collected and now we we wanted to leverage um, this uh, da this data that we have there into results that benefit our users so what we what we focused on there was uh, the proof conversions i mean this is the application that uh, that we have just heard uh, we are a formal verification company so we tried to to improve our our uh, proof engines using machine learning on the data that we have collected over the years and there's obviously two two directions one is time to hold so uh, and the, the time until you get uh, the final proof result that uh, there is no uh, there's no um, fault detected in your in your design whereas you have also uh, the time to fail uh, that where you <clears throat> want to see uh, where you actually detect the bug um the Time to fail is not so much in the focus uh, for us because uh, usually the, the engines are very quick in, in finding faults because um, basically a formal verification engine or proof engine is, is a, a failure generator. Whenever there's a failure, there's a possibility of a failure, it's going to find it and it's going to find it rather quickly. So what kind of beasts are there around the proof engines that are used? So ideally what you want to have is a sledgehammer something that you just we have one proof engine and a sledgehammer that solves all your problems but unfortunately that's not the case and on the other hand or you want to just kill two birds with one stone right you have one solution for everything this would be uh, the ideal situation and we would save a lot of r d time if it would be the case but this is the the reality right you have uh, several pro different problems popping up at different places and different design characteristics that that you have to that you have to solve and so this is why we have uh, not one prover and one proof engine but we have many and what i show you here is a is a breakdown of a of a larger um, benchmark set that we have uh, run uh, it's 1100 proofs and you see here we have not an equal spread over all proof engines but all of them do their share right so some solve only one percent of the problems some do 60 so that's very different and uh, so this is why we have a, a portfolio uh, many proof engines and we are running them uh yeah in a uh, intelligent way yes so the solution to the not there's a, not a single uh, silver bullet is that we that uh, formal verification companies use approver portfolios and they run different proof engines and so this is some of the depiction of this so on the left hand side we have the input the design and the assertions that the user wants to prove then we build from this uh, formal model and we have what we call here a little bit in marketing terms a heuristic engine director who sits on top of these and schedules the the problems uh, between the different proof engines and the technology I mean, that's no secret that, that uh, what we are using here, we are using sat, uh, satisfi satisfiability solving, binary decision diagrams, bounded model checking, and then there's um, uh, the, the <clears throat> developments in the past of uh, Craig interpolation uh, proof algorithm. And uh, this is the latest and greatest in proof uh, development. It's IC3 or sometimes also called PDR. This is uh, by far the strongest proof engine that is uh, out there. These are the publicly known ones that we are implementing. And of course we have our uh, derivatives of them. And then we have our private proprietary proof engines that we also have in this portfolio. Yeah, and if the proof, uh, and then we basically, what we do is we, we do, uh, we do um, a competition between them and the, the first one uh, wins. And uh, if the result is not on hold, um, but a fail, then you go into our debugging environment and, and uh, find the root cause of all the problem. 
And uh, you have seen several names for the proof engines before, so we are we do not uh, we do not give away what the actual proof engine, what the underlying technology of each proof engine, but we put them into three categories. Like here, you see in this team run, there's different teams running and different. They have different um, tasks and different uh, capabilities. So we have what we call app provers. These are provers that can only deliver in holding results. We have disprovers that only deliver fail, and we have provers that can deliver both hold and failing results. And how we are um, executing this portfolio, this is we have both parallel and sequential um, execution of these. So this would be a typical uh, proof scenario for, for a certain uh, check that is called. So we have three, we have two groups. In the first group, we have three, two variants of one approver and a second approver. And in the second uh, group, we have uh, two disprovers, two approvers, and two provers running. So this is a trade-off for for users to, to not uh, uh, use the arbitrary amounts of CPU time, and on the other hand, give uh, a very um, uh, give uh, predictable results. So what are the challenges that we have met when when we started this machine learning project? So is all this data that we have collected is it is it relevant? What do you want with a twenty-year-old design? Well, this 20-year-old design may a little bit may, may be substantially smaller than than what we currently have, but the the basic code patterns and and uh, what what uh, what gives verification challenges or challenges for our engines this has not changed much in the past. So, and yes, do we have the right data? Well, it's it's difficult to assess whether this is the right data, whether we have covered with, with this uh, test suite all possible uh, designs, but we have a very or most comprehensive uh, data set. So we, we are also playing in the system C uh, world. So we even have, so we have uh, RTL, Verilog and, and system Verilog and VHDL. We have system C designs. And for our uh, equivalency checking engines, we have also big netlist designs. So we, we think that there is uh, no bias in this um, data that we have uh, uh, used uh, for our uh, analysis. And uh, the, on the other hand, we also want to focus on complex problems. So whether we have uh, uh, design or a proof that takes uh, whether two minutes or one minute. This is not this big of a problem, but uh, when it comes to higher runtimes, that this is where the where the money is, right? So you want to have uh, uh, you don't want to wait hours in front of your um, computer, and but a minute or two that's not that's not the big difference. Yes, and. Uh, we now have a lot of data, but uh, yeah, a lot of data gives a lot of problems, right? So just to, to try the math, right? So we have more than 10 proof engines overall, so, and some variations for, for some of them. Then we have several parameters per proof engine that we have to, uh, that, that we want to, to uh, examine. Plus, um, we have, uh, uh, we just want to, to run each and every engine on, on each and every problem for for each and every test case. So just to do a simple math here, we have 10 provers, each has only 10 parameters, which is uh, uh, much less than, uh, than there is uh, there. So we have um, uh, just 100 designs, let's say 50 assertions, and each proof takes five minutes. So this already gives a lot, uh, something like five years of CPU time. So while this is uh, affordable, uh, maybe if you have uh, the, the biggest uh, verification challenge that you are facing and you have uh, and your device is built into a into a, a rocket that you cannot uh, change anymore once you have it deployed the, you may want to spend this but we cannot spend this and even and, and especially as we are running this repeatedly so we have to pick our our training data and basically categorize between training data and testing data where we want to validate uh, the data later on so, what uh, are the problem parameters that we want to uh, that we want to use for characterization or as input? As uh, we have just heard, um, this is one of the inputs that uh, would be to the machine learning. So, gate count definitely. The number of flops. How much arithmetic? Is there any counters? But bus width, 
size of the cone, um, and there's many more, and uh, yes, some are more relevant than the others, and uh, it's, it's, uh, the, the data collection is not so easy here. So, what was our preparatory work? So, we categorized the benchmarks into three categories. Easy. Easy proof takes less than 10 seconds. We almost did not look into these because um, this is uh, this is not uh, this is not even what I talked earlier. One minute or two minutes, so it's two th seconds or five seconds. It does not play a big role. But when it gets to the medium size, it's already uh, more interesting. Uh, these are those that we categorize them between 10 seconds and 30 minutes, and everything that is beyond uh, 30 minutes, we we um, judge as hard. And we are less uh, patient than our customers are. We are using a timeout of two hours. So two hours, uh, we know of users that wait longer for a proof. We, we don't for two reasons. One, we, we cannot wait uh, so often or depending on, on what uh, engine is running. And uh, we also, um, uh, we, we we cannot, uh, this is not so interesting in the end uh, to us if it's two or three or five hours. Okay, and what were our goals? We want to improve the run times on medium and hard, hard benchmarks. We want to decrease the number of timeouts. This to us is the holy grail. So if you get the problem that is not uh, tractable at the, uh, with, a car, with the one setting and you have it uh, uh, proven in, in the other setting, that's what we, that's we want, that's our the best result that we can have. This is going from practically unsolvable into solvable. And we don't want to have any regressions, so no additional timeouts and no big uh, big changes in the runtime. So what were the features, the inputs that we looked at? Uh, the always This is always restricted to the cone of influence, the number of gates, the number of inputs, the number of registers, the arithmetic structures, how many are in there, how many counters, how many FIFOs, RAMs, FSMs. And this looked at uh, for, for the whole design and for a single check. And what do we want to optimize? We want to optimize our default prover portfolio. We want to, um, uh, and, and we want to tune the parameters towards uh, the current proof. And what we also would like to is to predict the proof runtime and experiment that we've heard in the first talk. Yes, and uh, here is uh, the first project that we did. We tried to, we wanted to extend our prover set. And uh, here is uh, some real data from uh, from uh, something that uh, I needed to blur. Um, and uh, what you can see here is that uh, the more the more provers you add, uh, the the better the runtime, right? And uh, the number of strategies that are run in parallel here. You can see the time goes down uh, in this uh, here in this example here from uh, from from a default time of sixteen thousand down to ten thousand seconds over uh, five hundred checks. So this makes it uh, basically from thirty seconds per check down to twenty seconds, which is uh, quite an improvement. And if you have uh, more CPU resources that you want to spend with us, then uh, we even can go better. So this is uh, uh, again starting the, the same uh, the same um, set that we have looked at, and uh, now even using more strategies. And what you can see is basically we can slash the runtime uh, in half when uh, eight. Um, and so we have the runtime again on the on the uh, y uh, y axis on the x axis. We have the number of stretches is in parallel, and you can see from sixteen thousand down to eight thousand. We can slash the time in half when you use uh, more parallel strategies. Okay, so this uh, was our first project, and the second one was predicting the proof time. So what I have uh, on the left hand side here is the basic uh, way this uh, machine learning algorithm, how we applied it, and I will uh, give you a little bit of details on what we uh, on what we have uh, gathered the data and what the outcome is. So the diagram on the right hand side, this is um, for several designs, um, the exploration depths depth versus the time that was spent on it. And what you can see here, so the deeper you have to um, explore, the longer the time it takes uh, to, to get to a result. And so this is what, this was uh, one part of the input data that we give to the algorithm. And um, the, second kind, the second data that we give here is the, 
is the uh, features the, of the design that I talked uh, about some um, slides uh, before. So um, this is a bit of an eye chart. I'm sorry for this, but this is all the, the different um, characteristics of the design, whether they have, uh, have FSMs in there, whether they contain multipliers and, uh, and such uh, data that we have collected. And this data is fed into, um, into the algorithm, but uh, machine learning algorithms love to have data that is uncorrelated. And here this graph, um, it shows the, the, the red color depicts uh, correlated data, strongly correlated data, whereas the blue color uh, or the, the bluish color uh, depicts more uh, uncorrelated data. Uh, uncorrelated and the white one is the the uh, or the, the, the light blue one is this is the one that we want to have and uh, you can see that in the uh, now in this top triangle that we have here these are the the extracted features the reduced feature set um, that is uh, largely uncorrelated we did this uh, using a uh, principal component analysis uh, methodology in statistics that is uh, has been there for many years it's from the 1930s actually so all things are not necessarily uh, bad and here is um, the result of our training data so we were um, using um, uh, least angle regression uh, algorithm um, to to train uh, the uh, as, as, as um, the algorithm for the training, and what you can see here again, it's again not not uh, not easily readable. But basically, what you see is here we have uh, like if you see if you he see here the, um, uh, the on the left uh, bottom, so we have the predicted uh, depth versus the the um, versus the uh, real time, and uh, so this. Uh, this works looks rather nicely as so if you have a linear uh, curve in there basically or, or linear uh, in the in, in the uh, diagram basically this is what what you want to see so that the that the actual the actual steps here um, uh, play nicely with the with the steps that we have predicted and as goes for the time um, Yes, and then comes the last step that uh, already we, we also have seen in the previous talk. So we want to v validate the model outside of the training set on the uh, entire data. And here uh, in the previous talk, we have heard that that uh, uh, using uh, predicting proof runtime is a, is a sweet spot for machine learning and also for formal verification companies. So in our experiment, we have seen that uh, it didn't work out. So this now you see it's it's now running on on, on a different designs that were outside the training set. So um, so the prediction prediction uh, versus the the actual uh, number it, it it doesn't show this this uh, nice line in the in, in 45 uh, degrees angle. So this is uh, it, it. So in in our experiment this did not work out. So maybe we did it wrongly. Um, I cannot tell, but this was uh, for us uh, a uh, not so nice uh, outcome. <laughs> so uh, this uh, this concludes uh, the experiments that we have uh, conducted, and now um, I want to talk about uh, the results that we have seen. So, um, or the results uh, how we have uh, leveraged the data that we have uh, that we have uh, com uh, computed. So um, we have extended our pro default prover um, uh, portfolio <clears throat> to the provers that we have found out that are beneficial to the user. We have now we now automatically derive some prover parameters from the features that I have shown you. Um, we have um, added some user visible parameters for the proof engine tuning. Uh, the experiment I showed you at the beginning, where you, where the prover, uh, where the user now has more uh, freedom to select uh, certain prover parameters to improve his uh, time. And uh, as I said, the, the uh, second experiment that I showed you, the proof uh, runtime prediction for us, this was a failure. So to sum to sum it up, so um, what uh, did we achieve? We have now a system that uh, has faster proofs, 
mainly for um, for time to hold the time to fail this is also um, this is to us this is this sounds a bit uh, bit arrogant but this is a, a side problem that has also been uh, improved by this uh, by this experiment but mainly we have improved the the whole time to hold um, the users um, normally do not have to uh, pick uh, the the proof algorithm so we have uh, we have very good defaults or very uh, good uh, automatic setting of the parameters so uh, rarely our users have to um, set the proof algorithms but if they want to they they we have uh, full freedom to to allow them to um, so to set more and uh, we um, yeah, as I said, the, the proof strategies that we have extracted, they, they uh, have significant improvements we have seen in the convergence. Yeah, what are our next steps? So we, this is a continuous development. I mean, you're never done, ne fast is never fast enough. So we are continuously improving our engines, also using uh, these um, machine learning algorithms. Then there's a project that we have also uh, kind of has been uh, um, um, touched in the previous talk, so automated debug. So we have a little bit a different uh, view on this. So what what, uh, what we envision is basically that the tool basically finds out which part of the code is uh, is the culprit, which one is responsible for a failure of an assertion. Um, yeah, that, that's of course uh, very difficult and, uh, and, and uh, a task for the future, but we have some intermediate uh, results and uh, they look quite promising, so uh, the, don't hold your breath, but uh, we may uh, have something uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, and uh, we up to now only used uh, machine learning and we want to uh, add deep learning to um, to our portfolio for the uh, to, to our algorithms for for analyzing the data sets and uh, maybe maybe then uh, the runtime prediction uh, gives better results so we have not explored this up to now okay uh, one last slide on one spin so um, um, I already told you about uh, the three uh, three pillars that we uh, that we are concentrating on with our formal platform. Uh, we are also playing in the field of uh, Risk Five. Uh, we have presented a paper uh, recently um, at GOMAC, uh, a big uh, security conference in the U.S. Um, it's about uh, uh, verifying Risk Five processes and uh, and uh, verification IP for for a, a, a complete verification of, uh, of a RISC-V processor. And uh, yes, we're gonna present at the Verification Future Conference in Reading um, about our trust solution. And we're gonna also gonna uh, present uh, the trust solution at DEC later this year. Yes, that gives me, brings me to my last slide. Uh, thank you very much for listening. I'm, uh, yes, I'm the guy in the, in the back here. Uh, some of you I might have met and some maybe I will meet at DEC later in June. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dominic. Appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mike, do you have any questions for Dominic? No, I just want to say thank you very much to Dominic. And, yeah, and as, as Dominic says, they'll be presenting on security at the Verification Futures Conference in June. Uh, but you'll get details of that sent for any questions? Sorry. Yeah, we have one in Bristol, if we may, please. I'd just like to say uh, thank you for sharing the um, failed experimental results. Um, it's, uh, it's heartening. Thank you. That was a lovely comment then. Thank you. Any, any other further questions from Bristol? Any questions online? Um, and no questions from Cambridge or Grenoble. So thank you ever so much, Dominic. Really appreciate that. You're welcome. Thank you, Dominic.